Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. This is a warning to all of our knuckle draggers out there, all the men out there, to try really hard to stand straight up straight and listen, because today we've got a real smart guy on our show. It's Dr. Michael Healy, um, the professor of philosophy, Franciscan University of Steubenville, where I've been trying so hard to get my master's degree. Uh, but slowly but surely, I guess, is the way I'm, go I'm going to do that. But I love Franciscan, and we're so thrilled to have with us Dr. Micah Hilly will be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, the Catholic Church is for thinking people. The Catholic Church is where faith and reason meet. Uh, faith and reason, fide et ratio, the, the two wings of the eagle that help us soar towards God. And you know, I'll tell you, when I have my morning prayer, a lot of my morning time or my, or my meditation time is just reading amazing books. Uh, I find books like the One and the Many, a, a great book, one of our, our textbooks at Franciscan on philosophy. When I read like uh, these sort of books, it's like my mind just soars. I just, it's just like the universe is so cosmic to, to, to be able to be going deeper into the ways of the Lord, whether it's a doctrine or whether it's moral teaching or whether it's Thomistic philosophy. Um, it, it all, op anything that's truth opens us up more to the heart of God because ultimately God is love. So truth, the truth of God and faith of God ultimately lead us to that heart of God's love. And so today, fellow knuckle draggers, uh, we have with us Dr. Michael Healy, a professor of philosophy and so many other things, I can't list all of them, uh, at Franciscan University. Oh, and he's famous for being Matthew Leonard's father-in-law. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know if that's if that's a good thing or a bad thing. No, we love Matt that's Leonard. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. You guys, this is really hard for me because this guy's really smart. So just pray for <laughs> me that I can that we can have this this conversation and go a little bit deeper maybe than we normally do. Uh, tell us a little bit more just about your own personal journey towards becoming. Uh, I believe you're 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 a convert. Are you not? To well, I was a cradle Catholic um, okay. and raised uh, in a sort of a traditional way, uh, but sort of compartmentalized. And then I went off to college at Loyola, Los Angeles, and uh, started into a psychology major to figure out human emotions and secretly to figure out girls. Never figure that uh, one out. Never figure that and one out. And that's still ongoing, yeah. And um, I... Um, after two and a half years almost of psychology, I was more confused because uh, I was getting Freudianism, behaviorism, and humanism, uh, and I wasn't quite satisfied when I took a course from Dr. Rhonda Chervin called The Philosophy of Love and Friendship. Wow. And that was really what I was looking for. And we, you know, we went back to some of the classical uh, sources, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, but also Soloviev, uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, Dietrich von Hildebrand. No and kidding, wow. Yeah, that turned my life around, and especially a little article by von Hildebrand on the true meaning of sexuality was better than anything I'd ever read. Psychology is full of sexuality, but this was like scales falling from the eyes. So I changed my major, eventually got a double major in philosophy and psychology, but really to go on in philosophy with a focus on phenomenology, going back to human experience to see the proof for things and personalism, uh, as we see in von Hildebrand also, of course, in John Paul II, whom I got acquainted with in grad school. Also John Henry Newman, Kierkegaard as a Christian existentialist, uh, Gabriel Marcel, so I was off I want to be like I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I, I, but it was also a combination of events in my life. Mm. And, uh, the spring of my sophomore year it was like everything looked hopeful and was going well with friends, roommate, best friend. I was still hopeful about psychology. 
There was a girl I really liked that looked hopeful. And then I came back junior year and everything that I thought was hopeful sort of fell apart. Mm. And it was at the end of that semester, my dad got very sick mm. and was in intensive care for months. And so it's like every earthly source of positive vibes was ripped away. Mm. And I was left sort of alone with Christ, but with the decision, are you trustworthy or, or are you some kind of a monster to let all this happen to me? That's and yeah. eventually yeah. came down on the side that he was really with me in all this, that it was a kind of a stripping away and a purification. <laughs> well, how did you come uh, to that conclusion? I mean, th th what you, the statement you just made is a whole life in six months, you know, dramatic uh, change in trajectory one way or the other, but you were at a crossroads. Well, I think I'd always had a living faith. As I say, it was just kind of cartelized. When everything else was stripped away, it just came, became the center and the all-encompassing context for everything else. But you and, asked the question, are, are you a monster god? Or, 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 yeah. Or what, I mean, what was, how yeah, you... I, I guess it was just the love of Christ and uh, the sense that, uh, he had died for me, and that, that some of these things that happened were not just random torture, <laughs> mm. but that, in fact, they were a combination of both love and justice, both mercy and justice. It's so interesting. Uh, we were talking about this, uh, my son, Jeremiah, and I the other day. He's written an 85-foot wave, and he was talking story about that. We were recording an interview with someone, and he was saying that when he dropped into that 85-foot wave, uh, wrote it for over a mile, right? So there's a story to that wave. I'm sure. <laughs> but as he as he dropped in, uh, he said he knew that for the rest of his life he would regret if he never looked back. And when he looked back, he saw just this power. This it was. He said it was like this. The, it was so loud. It would be like the voice of many waters. Uh, the John heard in uh, in in the when the the cave. Uh, he was in on Patmos was cracked, you know, three those three yes. those three cracks in the cave. Uh, but he said, looking back in your life is very important because it lets you see your story, your personal story, and how God has invested in the good things, the bad things, the agendas that you had that fell apart, the stoplights, the yellow lights, the green lights, the detours that led from into pain, the detours that led into adventure, the detours that led you closer to Him. Looking that that moment in your life changed everything that season. Yes, and it developed into a big theme in my philosophical teaching mm. in my philosophy of the human person class. I have a major section on the human situation in relation to pain and suffering, and what that could tell us about God and about ourselves. And it's become uh, the most powerful section of that class. Uh, one time, the reason I got into that years ago, uh, I was teaching a class similar to that, and I gave the students the option to write their final paper on any theme they wanted. We we had six or eight major themes. About 80% of the students wrote their paper on pain and suffering, because already at that age, they've been through it. And even yes. more so in, in in the current generation where there's more societal disruption, more family disruption, you know, more divorce, uh, more drugs, more more false ways toward happiness. And, and a lot of the students, including at Franciscan, we get students from the American culture, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they have certain advantages, but they have similar problems and pains. And they're struggling to make sense out of loneliness and pain and suffering and what happiness would really be and what's the way to it. And it's the way of the cross. There's no doubt. You know, I remember C.S. Lewis when I, my my first when I was in college is when I had my first deep conversion experience through the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and I discovered C.S. Lewis, and he had this book called Miracles, and this book called The Problem with Pain, and I wrote I I, 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 I chose to write read the book on miracles, but it it is true, Doctor Michael Healy is who are speaking with Prof, Professor Philosophy Philosophy from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Uh, is that everybody's Rocky Balboa. There isn't a, if you go into the church and you see the little old lady praying the rosary, you think what could possibly be going on in her life that isn't just boring and, and, and yeah. no, she's Rocky Balboa. She's faced 
and is facing tremendous adversity, and but her her response to that was to turn to God in faith. Right? What what is it? Why why are we put it thrown into this into this world where Jesus said you'll have tribulation? Well, um, of course, it, it basically goes back to the fail, failure of the whole race at the beginning that sent us off in the wrong direction, uh, but not totally corrupted. We still have some in, natural insights. That's what's so fascinating about philosophy. What I found wonderful about it was that human experience and reason can see through and point in the direction of faith. There's no opposition there. There can be a beautiful marriage of faith and reason. And so when I discovered that my actual experience supported the faith, it, it deepened my faith. But I think we do have to go through purgation uh, because we're, we're always seeking uh, some kind of a false ideal on this earth. And even now, uh, you know, it's been 50 years since uh, my first conversion experience. You know, I still have every day in relation to the people I love uh, in relation to my children, friends, uh, I'll get an idea in my mind of how God should handle it. <laughs> yeah, we're talking <laughs> about if he doesn't handle it my way, it comes across back again to me as a kind of a threat. Is we're God trustworthy? That question comes up again and again because we set our sights uh, too narrowly. Oh, that's a beautiful way to say it too narrowly. We do not have the scope of vision that God has. We're talking with Dr. Michael Healy. He is famous for being Jack Leonard's grandfather, one of my <laughs> favorite kids. I love that kid, you know, Matthew Leonard's son. I got to interview him when I was at Steubenville. We were shooting Long Ride Home. This is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back with Dr. Michael Healy. All you knuckle draggers, don't be afraid. Just kind of like stand up straight so your knuckles don't drag on the ground. And listen, because we're going to have a really deep interview with Dr. Healy. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite everybody to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and it'll say free audiobook. Push this button. If you push that button and subscribe to our weekly uh, email newsletter, you'll get a free copy of my latest book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And, uh, and you also get uh, um, the radio show, the video version, the YouTube version of the show, emailed to you uh, before it even airs. And, uh, and speaking of which, also go to the YouTube channel, the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, and subscribe uh, to the Bear Wozniak Adventure playlist, and you'll get these uh, shows as we release them too on, on the, uh, on the, on the um, YouTube channel so you can see how handsome Dr. Healy actually is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Healy, we're so happy to have you on the show. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I'm just totally, I, I never understood why Catholic priests spend two or three years in formation and philosophy before they go deeper into theology, why it's so important to be able to reason. Hey, can I ask you a question? Is it okay if sure. I tell my wife 
that she's as she her beauty is Platoistic. I tell her, you know, Plato's forms. That she's yes. the form, the perfect form of what Plato would say a woman a woman is. Do you think she should take that as a compliment? I'm not. She's listening to me over here right now. Of course, she should take it as a compliment. Cindy, uh, you are Cindy. You are you are Plato's form, perfect form for an elegant, graceful woman. I don't know. She doesn't seem it, to be so enamored with that. Beauty starts with physical form, Plato says, and it causes our heart to grow wings and soar upward. That's what happens when I see and, her. It causes me to my, and of my course, heart to soar. Goethe, Goethe also said the uh, uh, the eternal womanly draws us upward. It's so the true. Women inspire men to go up. It's so true. You know, men are earthy from the dirt, but <laughs> someone has said to me that. The rib, the woman is formed from the rib, so she's more, I think it was Mike Aquilino was probably quoting someone else, but he told me that the woman's more highly distilled form of what a man is, and, and so we see more purely the love and grace of God. So now now she's not sure whether to take that as a compliment, that she's Plato, Platoistic in her beauty. <laughs> but let, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so then you, you fell in love with philosophy. Now. I have tried to understand, you know, a Thomistic philosophy, of course. We in the Catholic Church love St. Thomas. Uh, but what is the, the understanding of f f personalism and the phenomenology? Yeah. It's something that we think of John Paul II when we think right. of those terms. Why is that so critical? Why is that type of understanding so critical? What is it? Well, let me refer to my pathway again. Uh, when I hit Loyola and, and I took some core courses in philosophy and it was basically good stuff, uh, but it didn't sort of uh, light me up. Mm. Then later on, when I read von Hildebrand and Kierkegaard and Newman uh, and Marcel, uh, these were sort of the personalists. And uh, what it did was it, it got me so deeply and personally interested in the ultimate questions that then I was able to go back to the classical and medieval philosophers mm. and really see how much wisdom there was there because it was no longer just on the level of the intellect. My heart had been touched by the personalists and now the rest of philosophy uh, and the great philosophers of the fathers of the church in the Middle Ages with their own technical language that can be initially off-putting and things like that. Right, yeah. It all came alive. I realized how relevant it was, how existential it was. It was like you cracked the code. That's a, you that's know, a good good way to say it. Yeah. You know, I'll say for me, when I was at Baylor University, I was fortunate to go to a great Baptist university, although I was raised Catholic. It was it was uh, right in the city where I ended, ended up graduating from college, from high school. I was raised in California, but graduated from high school my senior year at, in Waco, Texas. And I'll, I will recall, I saw my other uh, Christian, my, my friends were, were, of course, most of them were all Christians, uh, but I didn't understand when they talked about personal relationship because I hadn't experienced that. But I went to a, a, I took a philosophy class. It was really cool too, Dr. Healy. It was maybe 14 of us in this room surrounded by those wonderful old books, you know, just like a, like a board of directors conference room, big table, but these incredible books. But we went through all of the philosophies, and but we missed a lot of them. Like you said, we didn't, we didn't, I don't remember us talking about Augustine or Aquinas. It was like we went through Socrates, Plato, we went all the way through Kant and, and on, on through um, to the to the the philosophers philosophers of the Enlightenment and things like that, but everything that I saw, you know, Plato gave me hope, but then I go, nah, not quite right. You know, Aristotle, yeah, but you know, and so at the end of that class, Doctor Healy, I, I was at the point where I was I think I was a junior in in high in college, and I thought I've been living a real righteous life. You know, not drinking, no drugs, no sex, uh, trying to live a good life. But it's almost like I said, if I can't find it in, in my faith, because I had been under catechized, and if I can't find it in philosophy, then why not wine, woman, and song? Why not sex, drugs, and rock and roll? You know, I was at that yeah. point. And it was at that point where the Lord caught me. When I went to my first Catholic charismatic prayer meeting, I realized you could have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. But I was, but I was not catechized. I didn't find the, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church. The new one hadn't come out yet. And I just I just floundered, and I walked, worked my way towards... Um, towards more of the Protestant. I didn't know anybody had written anything prior to 500 years ago, you know? And yes. so, but thank God, I, I, when I found the Catholic Church, 
I found, like right now, if I looked out my window, you'd see this beautiful ocean with Diamond Head in the distance. I found the Catholic Church is deeper and broader than any ocean. Uh, and so I, I came rushing to the Catholic Church because I found faith and I found reason. But can you explain to us what you mean by personalism? I mean, for people like me to understand. Yeah. Well, it, it has to do with um, showing a real reverence for the fact that each human person is endowed with a mind of his own and an obligation, therefore, to seek the truth and a will of his own and an obligation to use his freedom well and a heart to be touched by beauty and love and fulfilled therein. And what that means is each human person is more important than sort of the conglomerate of the race as a whole. I mean, that's why you can do things like sacrifice rats for the sake of the general good. You can run experiments on rats but you, you can't, unless you're like a Nazi, just run experiments on human beings, even if you have a good end in mind. Maybe you want to, you know, improve the whole race. But we can't improve the race the way we might try to breed horses, because that would be to insult the dignity and independence of each human being in their freedom and in their reason. And so it's an emphasis on individual responsibility which also, I mean, I think has been discovered, especially in the last hundred years, also in light of some milder kinds of alternatives, like uh, there were times when parents thought they could just direct their children into certain vocations or who to marry, uh, or men would rule over women or something like that, or uh, you know, all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, there was the division into free men and slaves. And I think personalism runs against all those kinds of subjugations. I mean, granted, the children are dependent on their parents and uh, owe them respect and reverence and obedience within limits. And parents have responsibility and authority, but they don't own the children. <laughs> it's God who owns each of us. And so... Uh, th this respect for the individual and the individual's decisions and choices and responsibilities is sort of at the core of it. Um, but there's there's several, I would say, false possibilities there. I mean, one is uh, the idea that is, since each individual is so important, maybe communion and community are not. Uh, but I would say a more realistic form of personalism, like John Paul II and Marcel and von Hildebrand, they would say, no, this deeper respect for the interior of the human person actually reveals even more mm. our orientation toward others, toward truth, toward goodness, toward God. And so it's not a sort of just exalting of the individual against the community, uh, but the discover of a deeper possibility of communion with others due to a deeper resolve, a deeper understanding, a deeper commitment. That's so beautiful. You know, uh, John Paul II's book, Love and Responsibility. Um, yes. And Thomas Aquinas' definition of love as willing the true good uh, and of, for the other. And then you think of John Paul II's uh, emphasis on self-donation, that really love is, is, isn't in a warm, gushy feeling. It's willing the true good for the other. Through, yes. through through the gift of self-donation. And so when you go as deep as you're talking about going, you go to the, re the, the reality of Jesus Christ. And so deep inside there, there's this cosmic birthing of, I'm one with the, the other members of the body of Christ, and there's a certain solidarity within mankind. When Jesus came and became incarnate, some sort of cosmic metaphysical reality where he was, he was, he was becoming s in solidarity with all of mankind. And at the cross... He, uh, he bore the sins of all mankind so we could be restored. And at the resurrection, he brought us back that hope of, of, of glory. We're talking with Dr. Michael Healy. we got to take a little break. Maybe you can uh, we can expand on that when we come back. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Dr. Healy, where can people find you? Do they uh, want to reach Franciscan out to you? University. Pardon? Yeah. If, uh, uh, my email is mhealy at franciscan.edu. If you want to find out more about him, all you got to do is Google 
Dr. Michael Healy and 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 the and Franciscan University, and you'll find out more about Dr. Michael Healy. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hang on to your hats, all you knuckle draggers. We'll be right back with Dr. Dr. Michael Healy to talk more about personalism and phenomenology. That's right. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Men, yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bear's Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite all the mama bears out there to go to our website, deepadventure.com. The other day, we were having a conversation about the direction of the ministry, and someone said, we need to really begin to focus more on the mama bears. And I'm like, mama bears? Is it like Goldilocks and the three bears? Uh, I had this kind of soft image of an ama, mama bear. And then the next day, out of nowhere, my son Jeremiah walks in and said, hey, Dad, remember when we had our cabin in Montana? I go, yeah. Remember how fierce the grizzly bears, the mama grizzly bears were? And I go, yeah. You know how they like, they really protected their cubs? And yeah, because I remember once my dad, who had a cabin up in that area too, walked into a clearing and on, he saw on the far side of the clearing in these, the deep mountainous woods, a log that moved. And he realized that's not a log, that's a grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear turned and sniffed and stood on, his, on, on, on two feet and started snapping the, her jowls because my dad had stepped between her and her two cubs. And so we respect the mama bears out there. We know your fierceness of your love for your family. And we want you to know you can come to our website and uh, subscribe to certain things we have for you. And we will send you tools that you can share with your with your family and friends that will help them uh, in a deeper walk with the Lord. So we love you, mama bears. Thanks for all your support that you do for our ministry. We're talking with Michael Healy, and we're talking about the concepts of personalism and phenomenology. You were talking about how the dignity of, of, of the individual, which is a very Catholic teaching, and about the very depths of someone's soul, you see imagio dei. How is it, where is it, how is it that Jesus, when he was incarnate, somehow what he did flowed into the potentiality for all mankind to be redeemed? Well, of course, he was the fulfillment of all things. And so the fulfillment of what it means to be a person, he starts as the second person of the Trinity, incarnate in Mary and the, the, the perfectly loving, self-giving human being for us to imitate. And he passes that tremendous grace and example on to Mary, to Joseph, to John at the foot of the cross, to all the saints at the foot of the cross. Uh, for us to imitate, and and so it's it's the deepest image of fulfillment philosophically, and also in terms of fulfillment of the person of personalism, and so the the deepest image of personalism or foundation and goal comes back, I think, to Christian revelation, uh, and it brings alive, as I said before, the great philosophical tradition. This is one of the great gifts of uh, John Paul II in his philosophical works, because uh, he acknowledges that St. Thomas objectively has all the insights there, metaphysically, about the human person. Objectively speaking, metaphysically speaking, he, he, he wraps it up beautifully, but St. Thomas doesn't go into the interior experience as much. That wasn't yet the theme philosophically. That was the turn philosophy took in modern philosophy, often in false ways, a, a kind of a false exaltation of the interior and the subjective. And John mm. Paul II wants to bring that entire interior life 
back into line with uh, the deepest, most objective form of metaphysics. And that's the, the best foundation. Okay, so then what is metaphysics? Well, it's the, the, the nature of reality. The, you know, the metaphysics has to do with the philosophy of being. And, but that has different meanings and levels to it. It can be being in the most broad, vague sense. It can be being in the highest sense of God himself. It can be being in the sense of substance, like Aristotle stresses the most real dimension of the world around us. Or it can be being in the sense of personal being, Mm -hmm. which is the highest type of being we have direct experience of. And so, you know, philosophy of being can encompass all of those. And the thing about personalism is many people in the 20th century were awakened to the uniqueness of the person. But if you don't have a, a good foundation philosophically for it, it can take it in weird ways. Uh, like Jean-Paul Sartre is all enthused about the power of the of free will, but he wants to use it to create our own meaning, create our own values, dominate other people. He doesn't have a sort of a solid foundation in being and in, in ethics and in love. Uh, others try to base, you know, personalism on a narrow uh, insight like that of Immanuel Kant, that a person should never be used as a means. He's an end in himself. But a lot of the rest of Kant's philosophy is is rather difficult, and you have to sort it all out. Someone like Martin Luther King at Boston University studied a form of personalism uh, that didn't have the best philosophic roots, but it basically went back to the Gospels. It went back to Christ. And so his letter from the Birmingham jail is one of the great classics of personalist expression of philosophy, the dignity of the person. Uh, but I think when someone like Wojtyla von Hildebrand, when they ground their personalist turn within to human experience, when they ground it in the whole tradition of metaphysics uh, summed up by St. Thomas, then you have the most powerful combination possible. And the angelic doctor, St. Thomas, I mean, he, he the depth of his personal his personalism, his own personal experience of Jesus Christ, uh, yes. is so profound, but that wasn't what his focus was on his writings. Let's take you uh, on, on another another in, step. In the, yeah. hymns, in the hymns that he wrote, yes, uh, for that we see, we say in Passion Died. I mean, those are basically love songs. Mm. There, the, his heart comes out. It, yeah, I'm convinced that he could have written million selling love songs today because he had a deep heart. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, Mike Aquilina writes songs too. You know, with uh, Dion, I love the fact that. Uh, oh yeah. But, but no, and the thing is, is when he we had that mystical experience, uh, Thomas, when he came back, he said, like everything I've written, I just he didn't have words to describe the intimate experience that he had when he uh, when he encountered Christ in that in that later on in his life. Now I have another question for you, and I think it kind of I think this all marries back to this experience of pain that you had in college, and the problem with pain. But can you talk to us now about what phenomenology is and how important that sure. is in 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 uh, grounding um, understanding of the human human being? The way I understand phenomenology, and there's different interpretations and schools of it, but uh, uh, it traces back to Edmund Husserl in Germany. And uh, he wrote a book in the 1890s on the philosophy of mathematics that was very subjective. I mean, it, it, rather than accepting universal truth in mathematics, he sort of subjectivized it all. And he wasn't quite satisfied with that. And so he continued his studies in logic. Mm. And in 1903, he published a two volume logical investigations which is really a rediscovery of and breakthrough again to realism. I um, mean, he basically comes back to agreeing with Aristotle. Uh, these logical laws are objectively true. And like Augustine says, they're above us. They rule our minds. We don't rule them. They rule us. And it's an implication of transcendence, of depth, of universality, of something to ground your life in compared to all the skepticism and relativism of the modern day. And that inspired whole uh, dozens of, of young people in, in, in those days 
uh, to come to study this sort of rediscovery of realist philosophy, which is kind of like a rediscovery of classical philosophy, because every real philosophical insight goes back to some deep experience, which then reason helps to clarify. And so my, for me, the phenomenological method is just the classical philosophical method. Pay attention to what's given to you in your rich experience, which you often miss. Sit back, think about it, like in silence. Uh, ponder it and let the rest of what's given to you come forth. And so philosophy is basically trying to bring to a deeper clar- clarity, a deeper understanding what's already given in your experience. And Phenomenology says go back to the things themselves. Like don't start out with some preconceived theory which limits your understanding. Uh, Break out of that and go back to the experience which is so rich you'll never fully uncover it. But you have to go back again and again. And we're going to talk a little bit more with Dr. Michael Healy. He's a professor of philosophy at Franciscan University at Steubenville where I've been laboring slowly. I'm on hiatus right now working towards my master's degree in, in theology. And, and just so captivated by the philosophy courses uh, that I've taken that I've taken there. I love the, I love Peter Crave. We love uh, uh, Saint Thomas. By the way, you can listen to the Summa. Uh, there's a, a app called Audiobooks where people actually volunteer to read. So I've listened to the Summa many times. Sometimes while I'm falling asleep, but um, a way to just expose yourself to this great thinking. This is Bear Wozniak. Uh, we want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and find out all that we do there. You know, we have the Ocean Sunrise Catechism every morning, um, Tuesday through Friday, uh, uh, going through the Catechism line by line. This is our second time through the Catechism, and it's usually filmed. It's on Facebook Live, and it's usually uh, we film it with the ocean in the background because usually the ocean is somewhere near my, I, I, where I am. So we invite you to go there to the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel also where you can see we have all of the, the entire catechism is archived there under its own uh, playlist. So it's a nice 10, 15 minute short little clip, clips that you can incorporate into your daily uh, prayer time. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We have with us today Dr. Michael Healy. Uh, professor of philosophy from Franciscan University of Steubenville. Dr. Healy, you hear this so much today, like uh, you hear it on a news interview. So what is your truth about this? Or what is your uh, 
you know, it's like truth becomes so relativistic. Yes. You know, it's like truth doesn't even really exist. Can you talk to us? Can you, can you take the phenomenology and the personalism that we're ref, referring to and talk about that relativistic truth and how we can, can contend with that? Yes. Um, I guess there's two different approaches there. One would be sort of on an abstract intellectual level, prove that that can't be the, the final word. Well, do that for us. Do that and for us first. So for <laughs> instance, Aristotle in the metaphysics and in the logic points out that the principle of non-contradiction, that the same thing cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same respect, that's an incontrovertible truth that you can see and understand. It's not just some postulate you have to jump to. You can see it. The way I explained it to my students is, and he says, it's the test for reality contact, the test for your sanity. Mm -hmm. And there you go back to phenomenology so and personalism. So if you're walking around campus, uh, I, I, I'll bring it back around, but you, the, as far as the abstract proof, if someone says you're walking around campus at night and, and they say to you, the moon is there and it's not there, and you have to figure out what he means. You may think, does he mean at a different time or in a different respect? And if he says, no, it's really there right now and it's really not there, you know you're not dealing with someone in his right mind. You don't try to philosophize with him anymore. You call campus counseling. He's got troubles. And this is Aristotle's point, that um, uh, there are certain truths you cannot deny without reintroducing them. One would be non-contradiction. Uh, another would be, as St. Augustine says, uh, if, if, I, if I am deceived, I am. So I can't be deceived about everything because in order to be deceived, I have to be. Now, mm. those sound like they're way out in left field. They're pretty unimportant kinds of truths in a sense, but they're the beginning. In other words, if certain things are definitely true, now we can be begin to distinguish between truth and mere opinion. We can ask what else we can know. And the fact that we can know something is very important. Uh, a famous German dramatist, Heinrich von Kleist, um, uh, who said that his dramas that he wrote were, were like a sacred call to him to try to present something true about the human situation. Then he became convinced that we can never really know how things are. We can only know how they appear to us. Uh, he was he was suckered in by Kant, basically. Right. And he eventually wrote a famous letter to his sister where he he said, I hope you don't think I'm just being silly, but this is the death of my highest goal in life. I can never really present anything true. And he ended up killing himself. Yeah, ultimately, and that's so, that that was his ultimate truth, though, because if you face well, that type okay, of reality, you know, what else yeah. would you do? As far as ultimate truth goes, we have to distinguish between what's true for me in the sense well, for instance, I'm, I'm sitting here in my dining room in a sense you could say that's a truth for me well what, what i meant what i meant by that for I me, to, it's true for everybody else too what i meant to clarify was that was his conclusion false conclusion yes. but to be true to that false conclusion what else is he going to do but you know kill himself you know because well, there's no yeah, there's no ultimate there end. i would say when you fall into a sort of philosophical like, trip, like nietzsche like nietzsche going crazy yeah I think uh, what you need to do is not kill yourself just because you can't figure out the trick. Go ask for help for crying out loud. Just because I can't explain something doesn't mean it's inexplicable. And so we have to be careful not to be trapped in our own mind or trapped in our own conclusions. Right. And so before you take radical action against yourself, go ask someone else for help or advice. Maybe they can help you out of your dark corner. Well, you know, pain does that. In well, other words, pain it, it, has the potential it, to wake us up. Yeah, right. Because he he's in this he's in this kind of malaise, and he's saying, you know, he can't find out what truth really is. And once you've come to the conclusion that you can never know what truth really is, you're like a, a ship without uh, a uh, a rudder or a compass. Yeah. But pain does uh, have. Let's circle back to that now because pain does have this way of bringing you focused, hyper focused on one thing. And, and it's, yeah, the, it's it a certain reality. Things away. It, it yeah. deepens you because you get beyond 
everyday concerns to, to more essential concerns. Now, one of the Christian existentialists, personalists, you could describe it differently, Gabriel Marcel, makes a huge point out of the, 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 the choice between despair and hope. Mm. And he ultimately uh, thinks that both on the human level of, of experience and on the level of revelation, there's really hope. But you only get there uh, by walking through the briar, pre- briar patch. Mm. Uh, he himself uh, had a very uh, sort of deprived youth, broken family, difficult school situation being picked on. And uh, at age 13, he thought about killing himself. And what saved him was beautiful music mm. because his family was not religious, but they were highly cultured. And listening to beautiful music gave him a glimmer of hope that there was some higher order and beauty and joy that he could participate in. So he didn't kill himself. Mm. He went on to college still as an agnostic, the, the whole pathway and evidence in human life that points toward hope, toward goodness, toward love, toward gratitude, toward things worth being you know, uh, faithful to. And he worked out a whole philosophy in that direction while still an agnostic. And then at age 39, he finally discovered Christ and converted. Uh, But it was his uh, philosophy going back to experience and to the dark sides of experience. His plays always have characters going through all kinds of troubles, the broken world. Uh, And yet through that, we can face our darkest fears and discover there's still light. But not everybody does. You see, it's a choice we each have to make to go in the one direction or the well, other. Let's talk, let's talk about that right now because now let's get back to being personal. Someone right now is really facing uh, a sense of loss or a sense of pain or a sense of vulnerability to the world where they've kind of lost control. On a personal level, what would you say to them? Um, I would say... Um, well, first, not to make their minds up too quickly that there's no hope. Uh, try to show a little bit of patience, which is one dimension of courage. We think of courage or fortitude as St. Thomas says, pouncing on the evil. But in a fallen world, we often have to endure patiently terrible things without letting them sour us, without letting mm-hmm. us be filled with resentment and anger and hatred. So I'd caution patience. And then I would begin asking questions about, uh, are there not still some good things in your life? What are they? Who are they? Because, uh, you know, we're surrounded by glory, but we get used to it. We fall asleep to it. Mm. And so what we need to do is go back to those key moments in our lives, past and present and hoped for, where the glory comes forth again. You have to turn your mind away from being mesmerized by the darkness and remind mm. yourself of the counter. There, there are answers to these things. There are, there are alternative experiences that can reawaken someone who's closed in on them. So. You know, there, I, I care about this, but there was a poet that wrote uh, a poem about faith, hope, and love. And the poem talks about how faith is like a strong uh, person standing and love is like a woman boldly, courageously nurturing her young. But that hope is like a little girl dancing in the morning sun. It's uh. Hope is something that springs to us and, and, and brings us light. And we're thinking not of tomorrow in the sense of we're thinking really of God. Hope has to have, we have to have that certain, do you know what I'm trying to say? There's almost like a dance in our heart that in the morning, even after a hard day, that be a day before we wake up and the, that little girl in us, here I am a, here I am a kind yeah. of macho guy, dancing the dance of, of hope, that everything will be new in the morning. His mercies are new. There is a heaven. There is a God above. Hope brings and us light. I think what we need for that is also to sort of clear away a lot of the clutter in our minds of all of the worries, the distractions, the desire to be distracted by entertainment, and go mm-hmm. back to more basic things. Um, in one of my classes, I, I make the students go through a book called The World of Silence mm. by Max Picard. 
And it, it's just a series of uh, reflections, not a big treatise. It's spotlights on experiences like watching the sun come up in the morning, experiencing the peace in a deep forest, mm. uh, experiencing love that breaks through to new levels. And uh, and he criticizes the modern world as the world of noise, it the is. world of distraction. And that can drive you to despair. So you well, have to go back uh, to nature, to, uh, yeah. to people around you and to God. Ultimately. It's so true. Uh, we have to take, we have to go, Dr. Healy. I, it's so true, okay. though. I remember a time of great, great challenge in my life. It was the breeze through the palm trees. I mm-hmm. would just look up and then beyond I would see the Lord. And every day I would just see hope there. We're, we've been talking with Dr. Michael Healy. He's famous for being Jack Leonard's grandfather. <laughs> infamous for being Matthew Leonard's father-in-law. <laughs> we invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, to find out more about our ministry. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha! Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.